Now, self-consciousness holds that object to be good and to possess intrinsic being in which it finds itself, and that to be bad in which it finds the opposite of itself. Goodness is the likeness of objective reality to it. Badness, however, their unlikeness. At the same time, what for self-consciousness is good and bad is intrinsically good and bad. For it is just that in which these two moments of intrinsic being and of being for it are the same. It is the actual spirit of the objective realities, and the judgment is the proof of its power within them, a power which makes them into what they are in themselves. It is not how they are like or unlike directly in themselves, that is not abstract being in itself or being for itself, that is their criterion and their truth, but how they are in the relation of spirit to them, their likeness or unlikeness to spirit, spirit's relation to them in virtue of which they lose their initial status of objects and develop their own in itself or intrinsic nature, becomes at the same time their reflection into themselves through which they acquire an actual spiritual being, and what their spirit is comes to view. But just as their first immediate determination is distinct from the relation of spirit to them, so also will the third moment, their own proper spirit, be distinct from the second. First of all, their second in itself, which stems from the relation of spirit to them, must of course turn out to be different from the immediate in itself. For this mediation of spirit rather acts on the immediate determinateness and makes it into something else. I think that paragraph 496 can be quite a difficult transition point, in part because Hegel here is talking about all of these in itself and you know first one and a second one um, what is he actually getting at there he's using these these categories that i think by this point in the phenomenology we're pretty familiar with um, but he's he's differentiating them against each other and a lot of this is is quite abstract so let's see if we can unpack this a bit and and make some good sense of it uh, a lot of it will you know, fall into place as we move into the paragraphs yet to come. So he, he says that um, self-consciousness is, at this point, is going to differentiate between the good and the bad. We've already seen that taking place, the gut and schlacht, right? And he says that it's, it's holding that object to be good and to possess intrinsic being, that is to, to exist on sich in itself, in which it finds itself. So self-consciousness finds itself in some object. And remember, the objects that we're talking about here are wealth on the one hand and state power on the other, not something else like, you know, the project of painting a house or, you know, doing one's taxes or anything like that. We're talking about these two fundamental polarities within the ethical substance. So he goes on and he says, um, it finds the, that to be bad in which it finds the opposite of itself, um, in which it finds a lack of equivalence. So it finds something like itself to be good, and it finds something unlike itself to be bad. And so the same thing could be good or bad, depending on how it is that self-consciousness is orienting itself to it, how self-consciousness is perceiving it. And this could be another self-consciousness. This can be, you know, state power or its representatives, wealth or its representatives or one's experience of it. In any case, what's going on here is the bad is being identified with unlikeness. And this is going to be happening throughout this section. So he says, goodness is the likeness of objective reality to it. And here Hegel you know, uses gegenständliche Realität, right? He doesn't, he doesn't speak in terms of Wirklichkeit, uh, which we might translate as, as reality or actuality uh, either. Um, he, he talks in terms of something being an object, right? Gegenständliche, presenting itself as an object as a, a reality. So goodness is the likeness. The Gleichheit, the, you know, Gleichheit, you could, you could say likeness works quite well. Um, the equation, the, the adequation, uh, you know, something which is adding up to, to this, this uh, 
likeness, adding up, uh, showing us that, that it really is the thing, right? Um, and then he says, badness is their unlikeness, ungleichheit. Now, is that the end of the story? No, because he goes on and he says, uh, what for self-consciousness is good and bad is intrinsically, an sich, good and bad, for it is just that in which these two moments of intrinsic being and a being for it are the same. So there's a kind of abstraction going on here. Um, and, and, you know, whenever we're dealing with abstraction in terms of Hegel's phenomenology, we, we, we're not really finished with what it is that we're attempting to do. We want to get to the concrete. So what we've got here is what we could call an abstract in itself and for itself. The, the good is that which is in itself. It possesses intrinsic being, but it does so at, at least at first at this point for self-consciousness in an abstract way. And the bad, likewise, is just being set up as its opposite here. So he says, um, it's the actual spirit of the objective realities. The, and the judgment uh, is the proof of its power within them, a power which makes them into what they are in themselves. So here we have an interesting way of using this notion of in itself. Typically, in the Hegelian dialectic, the in itself has been construed as that which sort of unfolds itself, that which is already there, right? That which is, in a certain sense, uh, uh, not for itself, that which is not conscious of itself, which is not taking a position in relation to itself, but that which is just, you know, just there. It, it just is, right? Here Hegel is talking about spirit making the things that, that are in themselves be in themselves. Does that mean that spirit is just postulating them there? No, what it means is that to be in itself is in a certain sense to be made to be in itself, to be brought out as what it is. That sounds rather abstract as well, uh, but, but I think you'll forgive that abstraction for a moment. So he says, it, is, it isn't how they are like or unlike directly in themselves, not abstract being in itself or being for itself. That is their criterion and their truth. Now notice he's not saying that they don't have abstract being in itself or being for itself. He's just saying that's not here going to be their criterion and their truth. And remember, truth is something that for the Hegel uh, dialectic, Hegel's dialectic, has to be developed, has to be unfolded, right? It's not something that we, we take as a certainty of his height right off the bat, but something that we earn. And that is what spirit is doing in this, this process. So what else can we say about this? He goes on and he says, it's their likeness or unlikeness to spirit, right, that, that matters. How they are in the relation of spirit to them. Spirit's connection, its relation, its engagement with them, he says, is what, gives, what allows them to lose their initial status of, of being just objects for self-consciousness and to develop their own in itself, their own intrinsic nature, their anzik height, we, we might say, right? The, the, what it is that they are. So goodness and badness aren't at the beginning entirely what goodness and badness are. Spirit has to work upon them and show us what genuine goodness, genuine badness actually are by making them into something more than just mere objects for spirit, giving them a kind of agency. This is something we're going to see unfolding a little bit later in what we can call not just you know, wealth and state power, but the noble and base consciousness. So he goes on and he says, um, this is what gives them an actual spiritual being. And that, that way what their spirit is comes to view. And then Hegel says, well, look, for, we had a first immediate determination, and that's distinct from the relation of spirit to them. And then we have a third moment where what we're talking about is their own proper moment as good and bad, now as spirit sort of apportioned off to each of them. He says this is going to be distinct from the second. 
And he says, their second in itself, which stems from the relation of spirit to them, must turn out to be different from the immediate in itself. Now, isn't that an interesting thing to say? In itself is usually taken to mean something that is self-same, right? Something that remains the same over time. Something that we can rely upon. But here Hegel is saying, even for the, the good, which is supposed to be in a sort of self-same relation to itself, to self-consciousness, to spirit, there's a, there's a slippage. There is a movement from the first in itself to the second in itself. So the, even the in itself has some disparity within itself. So he says, um, this turns out to be quite different. And he talks about this in terms of the mediation of spirit acting on the immediate determinateness and making it into something else. So even in the self-same, there is an othering taking place. It follows then that the consciousness that is in and for itself does find in the state power its simple essence and subsistence in general, but not its individuality as such. It does find there its intrinsic being, but not what it explicitly is for itself. Rather, it finds that the state power disowns action qua individual action and subdues it into obedience. The individual, therefore, faced with this power, reflects himself into himself. It is for him an oppressor in the bad, for instead of being of like nature to himself, its nature is essentially different from that of individuality. Wealth, on the other hand, is the good. It leads to the general enjoyment, is there to be made use of, and procures for everyone the consciousness of his particular self. It is implicitly universal beneficence. If it refuses a particular benefit and does not choose to satisfy every need, this is accidental and does not detract from its universal and necessary nature of imparting itself to all and being a universal provider. Here in paragraph 497, we're going to see the very first of the major reversals involved in these judgments about good and bad and, and what their objects are take place. And something similar is happening here to what we saw happen just earlier in the spirit section in terms of the divine law, the human law, the individual human being that oriented him or herself in relation to it. Here, of course, our polarities are wealth and state power. And up until this point, um, Hegel either has been talking about just the good and the bad themselves uh, in terms of likeness and unlikeness, or he has been talking about wealth as being the bad and state power as being the good. Now we see the first of these shifts in which somehow the good becomes bad and the bad becomes good. In this case, it's going to be state power that turns out to be bad somehow. Now, how does that happen? Uh, notice that, that one of the things Hegel is not going to do is to totally, you know, change everything and say that state power isn't, you know, the essence, the vasen, or the, uh, as we're translating here, the subsistence, the bestehen uh, of, of the human being, of, of the individual. But he's going to change the meaning of these for the individual. And, and it's important to remember here the stress that Hegel is laying upon judgment, upon, uh, you know, another way of translating judgment here, there's, you know, that's, that's got a technical sense to it, right? Where we bring something under a concept and all that. But another way of thinking about judgment that's a little bit older and more old-fashioned is to think about it in terms of uh, opinion or in terms of standpoint. Um, you know, we, we can be wrong in our judgments and, and our judgments can change over time. So Hegel says that the consciousness that is in and for itself, right, the human being that we're talking about in this case, and it may not be all human beings at this point in history that are in and for themselves, but at least somebody, some individual consciousness attempting to orient itself 
thinking out, you know, what is the good, what is the bad in terms of wealth and state power, which are two very important, you know, social forces, we might say, or phenomena, things that present themselves to us. He's going to say that it, it does uh, find in the state power its simple essence, its vasen, right? It finds its essentiality, what it is, who it is, who, who it matters to, and its subsistence. But it doesn't find something else. It doesn't find its individuality. There's no room for its individuality within the scope of state power. Now, isn't that a strange thing? Why couldn't it, you know, be an individual in relation to state power? Staatsmacht. Why, why can't it serve state power and retain its individuality? Well, oftentimes, you know, state power in order to exercise it properly or to, to serve it, you, you will have to sacrifice things that you would say are, you know, related to you, perhaps your family life, right? Um, or perhaps, you know, in times of war, your own life uh, or the life of those members of your family. Just think of, you know, some of the great heroes in, you know, Rome or, you know, in the Middle Ages. Uh, and this is really about the, these sorts of times. Um, so they, those provide us with some, some examples. You certainly do have to sacrifice your own desires, the objects of your desires, where perhaps your happiness may lie at certain points uh, in order to satisfy the demands of state power. You also sacrifice your own individual judgment in a way. And perhaps that's even more important here. So he says, it finds that state power disowns action qua individual action. That is, it subsumes the individual action into its own. The individual action matters insofar as it fits into the projects and the aims and the values of what, what constitutes state power. So, you know, for instance, if you're a judge, um, you have a certain function. And so long as you're performing that function well, you have some manner of discretion, uh, not only in terms of how you decide cases, but how you run your courtroom and, you know, uh, perhaps even how you, you dress to a certain extent, right? But you can only go so far with that. It's, it's, it's not, you know, whatever you deem uh, to be fit, because if you do that, you are setting yourselves at odds with the, the state power. And this would take place in, in a variety of different ways, right? Um, anybody who's been in the military, I don't, I'm sure there's something like this in the other branches. We used to say there's the right way, the wrong way, and the army way, right? And the army in this case is state power. Its way is the way that we're going to worry about. Right and wrong, uh, that is for the army to decide, not for you as the individual to decide. Of course, you know, in certain ex cases, they want you to exercise initiative, but that is for the purpose of the, the greater whole, isn't it? So he goes on and he says, it disowns action qua individual action. And here's where, where the, the bad comes about. It subdues it into obedience. So what it is that the individual has to offer, their own unique perspective on things, perhaps their, their own talents and skills and propensities and all of these things that make them who they are, their background, their, their memories. You know, state power is not interested in that. State power is, is looking for somebody who can fill the position, do the job, and then shut up and go home and get ready to do it the next day when state power wants it done, or perhaps in the middle of the night, you know, if they go on alert or something like that. So he says, state power subdues the individual into obedience. So the individual faced with this power, he says, reflects himself into himself. Now, that could be as prosaic as having one of these sort of flash moments where you're like, what the hell is going on here? What, what am I doing here? I, I thought I was like furthering democracy or being part of a, a, you know, a greater whole or becoming an army of one. You know, if you think about the old ads that we used to see, right? I thought I was doing something meaningful, but I'm just taking orders. And so 
the individual, by being for itself, comes to a position where it judges. It doesn't just feel, doesn't just think, doesn't just receive from the outside, but actively judges state power to be something bad, to be an oppressor, to be impeding it in its unfolding, its development, in, in satisfying its desires. So state power is gone from being something fundamentally good, precisely because it did provide the essence, to being something now bad. So he says um, it becomes an oppressor and the bad. Instead of being of like nature to himself, its nature is essentially different from that of individuality. It's not an individual. A great example of this, you know, we have this interesting legal fiction here in the United States that was affirmed in a, a very important legal case uh, that the Supreme Court heard a while back. Uh, and it had to do with the notion that corporations are persons. And you could, you know, I understand that you might say, well, the corporation is on the side of wealth, but really, insofar as a corporation behaves in a sort of hierarchical manner and has a chain of command and comes to dominate an area. Think about these massive multinational corporations whose uh, you know, uh, earnings are greater than the GDP of many countries. They actually are functioning much more like a state power, aren't they? And each of these, these corporations is something different than a person. You know, we, the, the real upshot of that, of course, had to do with political discourse and not political discourse as actual political discourse, but political discourse as shooting lots of money into the, <laughs> the veins of the, the body politic, right? Um, but, you know, and don't, don't let that seduce you into thinking that we're talking about wealth here because what we're really talking about is a kind of power, a uh, kind of way of dominating the system and deciding for entire swaths of people the way things are going to go. A corporation is something fundamentally different than a person. A government, even more so. And what is Hegel talking about here? You know? The individual cannot deal with state power or any organization as if it were dealing with another individual. The, the individual, in a certain sense, doesn't matter in relation to state power, except insofar as the individual fits into, as I said, the designs and demands that state power imposes upon it, which are experienced as being bad, and oppressive. What's being experienced as bad and oppressive there is a fundamental lack of recognition that the state power is unable to provide precisely because it is so fundamentally different from the individual. And there's lots of interesting confusions that take place here that we could chalk up to kind of an ideology or you know, the workings of, of psychological dynamics. You know, in, in medieval times, there was this, this uh, uh, tendency to identify the state power with the, the figurehead at the top and to say, you know, well, the king really cares about me or the prince or the count or whoever you like, right? Sometimes the bishop, the abbot, um, but uh, you know they, they they really care about me as as a an individual person, even though I'm very lowly. Um, but you know the reason why the state behaves like a jerk to me is because of the bad ministers. You know, um, if the king really knew what was going on, he'd set this all right. And you know, half the time it turns out no, the king does know what's going on and, and is is signing off on it uh, because you know, as representative of this state power, the king doesn't care about the individuals, except insofar as they they fit into that scheme. So, what about wealth then? How does that fit in here? Hegel says that um, the individual uh, you know is going to now turn to looking at wealth. Wealth becomes the good. Why is wealth the good? Is it because we retreat into, if we can't have power, we retreat into a pecuniary interest and say, you know, uh, sour grapes 
those grapes over there are more tasty. Uh, I'll, I'll pick some of them and maybe trade some of them and we'll circulate them around. No, Hegel is, is uh, really attuned to what goes on within economies. Wealth is never just the wealth that is accumulated and sits in somebody's storehouse or treasury or bank or under your mattress. It's something that allows exchange, that allows circulation, that, that gets people's desires to align with each other. So Hegel says wealth is the good. It's judged as the good here. Why? It leads to the general enjoyment. It produces something that is general and general in a different way than the essentiality of the state is. A general enjoyment, an enjoyment in which each individual can have their share. This is idealistic, of course, right? In the sense that, uh, is that the way economies really function? No, well, quite a few people are getting screwed at any given time. But there is uh, you know, the fact that some people are actually getting something out of it. And so there's this possibility of, you know, as we say, all boats floating to the top, right? We're going to build, we're going to job growth our, our way into universal happiness. Well, Hegel's talking about something like that. He says wealth is there to be made use of. That's another thing that's well worth thinking about. Wealth, like I just said, isn't really wealth when it's just being saved. It's there to be made use of. It's there to be uh uh, you know, exchanged for other kinds of wealth. It's there, you know, money is there to be exchanged for property or services or even promises about things that are going to happen down the line. Sometimes we use money to, to try to make more money too as well, right? Or we convert money into other money, uh, usually losing a little bit in the process, uh, unless we're currency traders in which we gain some in the process. And he says, uh, it procures for everyone the consciousness of his particular self. Isn't that an interesting thing to say? It procures for everyone the consciousness of his individual self. So the, the, the individual person who was, you know, sort of, as Hegel was saying, reflected in upon him or herself is able through wealth, through the generation of wealth, through the spending of wealth, through the circulation of wealth, to get to know who and what he or she is. You might say, uh, if we want to be a little facetious here, and and you know play off of uh, you know little lines like you know you are what you eat, we might say, you are what you purchase, you are what you earn, and that would be in fact truthful, at least to a certain extent. Uh, some people are entirely consumeristic. And that's all they've got going for them, right? Um, others, you might say there's, there's things, elements, dimensions that escape the, the, you know, the economy. Um, but it is quite important. This isn't something that we should just abstract away and say doesn't matter at all. Hegel is aware that economic things uh, really have a big impact upon ourselves. So he goes on and he says... Um, it is implicitly, wealth is implicitly universal beneficence. Now, notice he's being more realistic in saying this. If it refuses a particular benefit and does not choose to satisfy every need, this is accidental and does not detract from its universal and necessary nature of imparting itself to all and being a universal provider. He talks about wealth here as being a universal provider precisely because wealth stands for this economic nexus which draws all of these individuals in, has them work, has them exchange, has them consume, has the whole process replicate itself. This is starting to sound a lot like Marx, isn't it, at this point? <clears throat> and there's a good reason because Marx did in fact take quite a bit from Hegel. Who knew about this? He was not uh, unconscious of the, the existence of an economy within which he lived. You know, Hegel had a job. Hegel had to, had to, to buy things and provide for, for uh, himself and, and for others. So what is he talking about here? He says, you know, 
Implicitly, this could provide benefits to everybody. Um, it doesn't actually provide benefits to everybody, but when we're looking at the wealth side as the good, what we're ignoring, and here's where Hegel and Marx would actually depart from each other, what we're, what we're uh, saying is that um, you know, it, 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 it's uh, not going to satisfy every need, but that's merely accidental that it doesn't detract from this universal necessary nature of providing something for everybody. And so what we get here is something like an uh, endorsement of the, the role of the market, and not called the market as such, understood more in terms of the economy and wealth. Um, and of course, state power is going to be connected with this in some way. But notice how stark the contrast that we've got here is being set up. Uh, and notice that we now have the good on this side as wealth and the bad on this side as state power with the individual in the middle judging both of them. 